Again, here tonight, we're still studying in the great books of First and Second Peter. We're still fairly early in our study. We're in First Peter. We're going to be in chapter 2 tonight. And the theme of First and Second Peter is pretty obvious when you read those letters together. Uh, it's about how do we live a godly life in an ungodly world. And I think we would all agree we have an ungodly world that does not share the values of God or the priorities of God. And the church is to be an outpost for God here in this world. We are to be the place and the people who show the world what God has in mind by how we live, by how we think. We're to live a countercultural kind of life. The problem is we all know that. The problem is we need instruction on, okay, how do I do it? And that's what First and Second Peter is about. Here's what you're supposed to do. So in First Peter chapter 2, let's read verse 11 and 12. I didn't get to this last week. It was supposed to be part of last week's lesson, but that's fine. 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12, he says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. He says right here, that we are exiles, or some of your versions might say sojourners. If you want to know what a sojourner is, take a look at David and Susan. <laughs> They've been sojourning for two months, just didn't have a home. They were just going all over the United States, but they're finally back, and we're glad to have them back. But a sojourner is a person who we, uh, or, or an exile, or some of your versions might say alien. That, those are all good translations. We don't fit in this culture. We don't fit with this world. We never feel at home. We just we feel like we're out of place. And the truth of the matter is, if we ever get to where we just feel completely comfortable in this world and with the things that are going on, there's probably uh, something wrong with our Christianity. We're not really meant to completely fit here. Uh, I want to point out a couple of things. I quoted this verse, verse 11, Sunday morning in my sermon. It's a great verse. He says, I urge you, there's urgency in his voice here. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Let me ask you a question. This is where hopefully we'll get a little bit of discussion. How do sinful desires wage war against our soul? How do they do that? Sorry, David. Okay, they separate us from God. Make, could make us indifferent to the things of God. Pardon me? Okay, they're the things of the world, but how does that, uh, how does that wage war against our souls? should cause an inner conflict. And I bet all of us have probably had some experience at times if we were thinking or doing something or not doing what we should have been doing. We probably did feel that inner conflict that Laura was thinking about. We're just not in harmony with what God wants us to be. Ken? Yeah. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit in that, uh, where's that, Ephesians 4 verse 30, I think. I don't know. I think it's the where it is. Yeah, we grieve the Holy Spirit by uh, when we do sinful things because the Holy Spirit lives in us. That's what the gift of the Holy Spirit is. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit in us. Um, I want us to talk about for a second what some of these passions of the flesh are, he says in verse 12, or sinful desires, however your version translates it. Uh, if you go back to chapter 2, he kind of specifies what they are. In chapter 1, verse 14, he said, do not conform to evil desires. That's chapter 1, verse 14. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, he's going to tell us what some of those are. Now listen to what some of these are. They might not be what we would originally think. Listen to his list, 2-1. Rid yourselves of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Those aren't the things we normally would think of when we talk about passions of the flesh. Now, there's some more coming later, but these are kind of inner attitudes. Envy, he says. Deceit. Malice. What's malice? 
Now, ill will, hateful things. Unfortunately, sometimes God's people can be hateful to each other. It's very similar to some lists in Colossians and Ephesians both. That's true. Uh, ill will towards any, anybody, really. Hatefulness is a, a, something of the flesh that's not the will of God. And those kind of things wage war against our souls. Envy, hypocrisy, and then he says slander of every kind. I think this is the one that's the most widespread problem. Let's all admit it. There are times when every one of us have caught ourselves speaking unkind words about someone who is not in our presence. That's slander. Slandering their name. That's not the will of God. Those kind of things wage war against our souls. I think what happens sometimes is there are certain sins that we categorize as acceptable sins. Now that's our thinking. God doesn't categorize them that way. And I think slander is one of them. Apparently it is because it's so widespread. But God says these kind of things wage war against your souls. And then if you look in chapter 4, we're continuing to talk about what are these uh, sinful desires or passions that we need to get rid of. Chapter 4, verse 1 through 3, he says he's going to give some more. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they don't live the rest of their earthly lives for human evil desires, but rather for the will of God. You have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do. And here's the list. Living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. That's the list that we typically think of. These are passions of the, of the flesh which wage war against our souls. And they do. Those are included. But I wanted to bring up the other one before because some of those inner attitudes of deceitfulness and envy and slander and just having ill will towards other people, sometimes we think those are acceptable kind of sins and we don't think they're that big a deal. They're a big deal to God and they should be a big deal to us. And he says they wage war against our souls. You know, this graphic right here says that we're exiles. It kind of reminded me when I was studying this week you remember in the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, uh, does anybody happen to remember? I know this is a hard question. Uh, do you remember what Moses named his firstborn son? Gershom, exactly right. And you win the prize. You know what Gershom means? It means that. It means stranger, foreigner, exile. Moses was giving him that name. Names really meant a, a lot at that time. He's saying, you know, here's what you can expect. We're, we're not meant to live here in this world polluted the way that it is. So you're a foreigner. You're, an ex, you're an, a person in exile. Um, I love what he says here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. He says, live such good lives among the pagans. That shows that we have to live in the world. We have to live amongst people who aren't Christians. We should not isolate ourselves from the world. We have to live among them. We can't ever influence them if we don't. But the, the balance, which is hard to achieve, is to influence them for good and for Christ rather than them influencing us negatively. But he says, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Uh, I found an example in one of the resources I was using. I thought this was pretty good. Let me see if I can find it here. Here we go. Wait, no, that's not the... Let me get the right page here. Oh, I was only 100 pages off. In the summer of 1805, a number of Indian chiefs and warriors met in council at Buffalo Creek, New York, to hear a presentation of the Christian message by a Mr. Cram from the Boston Missionary Society. This is a true story. After the sermon, a response was given by Red Jacket, who was one of the leading chiefs. Among other things, the chief said, he said, brother, we're told that you've been preaching to the white people in this place. These people are our neighbors, and we are acquainted with them. 
we will wait a little while and see what effect your preaching has upon them. If we find it does them good, makes them honest and less disposed to cheat Indians, then we will consider again what you have said. Our behavior matters. And that's what he says there in 1 Peter chapter 2. Live such good lives out there among the pagans that they're not going to have anything bad to say about you, he says. And if they accuse you of doing wrong, they'll see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. The way that we live speaks volumes. And whether you're talking about the way the white people lived among the Indians in the 1800s or the way that Christians are to live in this culture that's very ungodly today, it speaks volumes. They will wait to see whether or not our actions match our words. And if they do, it can have a great, great effect. I want us to read verse 13 to 16. And as we read this, I want you to think, what is the uh, concept that jumps out at you more than anything from these verses. So look in verse 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it's God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people. Do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Now when we read those verses there that we just read, what theme stands out at you, jumps out at you more than anything else? If you were going to sum this up. Don't everybody answer at one time, okay? Let me read it again. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. I think this is the main theme. And not only is it the main theme here, if you keep on through the rest of this chapter and into the next chapter, he's going to keep talking about submit, submit, Submit. This is not a popular subject among Christians in the culture in which we happen to live. This is not a popular subject at all in the culture in which we happen to live. But this is what my Bible says. This is what your Bible says. We are to live a life of submission. He says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. He didn't say you have to agree with every human authority or every government that you're submitting to. He says you do it because you are submitting to God. He says whether it's to the emperor, the emperor would be akin to our what? The president. You may not like our current president, or you may not like the one before, or agree with their policies, or you may not be a Republican or a Democrat or whatever your party is, but this does say that we are to submit to them. Whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him, God. If you go read Romans chapter 13, to sum up Romans 13, he says that the reason we even have governments is because God established them. It's God's will for there to be government. You say, well, our government's corrupt. I know that. Both parties are corrupt. I understand that. But I want you to think about this for a minute. And I know what some might be thinking because I've had this thought before. You're like, well, Christian, you know, we are to obey God and not men. There's even a verse that says that. And you would be right about that. But Peter is saying this to a group of first century Christians whose leader or the person who was in authority that he's telling them to submit to was who? Nero. Now, I don't know how bad you think Biden is. Actually, that's not correct to say President Biden. Whether I agree with him or not, he's still our president. You may not be able to stand him or his policies or his character or whatever. You might not have been able to stand Trump or his policies or his character or whatever. Or President Obama before him or George Bush 
or Bill Clinton back in the 90s or whoever it is or Richard Nixon back in the 70s or whoever it happens to be at the time. You may not be able to stand them or their policies. But let me say this, none of them are even close to as bad as Nero. Nero was a brutal, horrible tyrant. None of the people I just mentioned are even in the ballpark compared to how bad Nero was. And knowing that, he says to these first century Christians, he says, you are to submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. It's not because you agree with them. You're not agreeing with them when you submit. When there is civil disobedience on our part, it gives us a bad reputation. Kim. Yeah. Now, I know there are times in the Bible, I just quoted a verse a minute ago, uh, we must obey God rather than men. That's in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, when Peter and John were told, you are not to, you're not to teach or preach anymore in this name. They'd put them in prison before that, and then they got busted out of jail, and they're out in the streets teaching and preaching, and the authority said, you're not to teach or preach anymore in this name. And they said, we must obey God rather than men. If a government is plainly, plainly telling you to do something that is plainly against God's word, we're to obey God rather than men. But simply because I don't like the policies of Donald Trump or Joe Biden or Barack Obama or George Bush or Bill Clinton or Richard Nixon or whoever or, you know, whoever's going to be president in the future. Just because I submit doesn't mean I'm agreeing with their policies. These first century Christians weren't being told to compromise their faith and agree with everything Nero did. They just said, you're supposed to submit to them. And I know in our culture, we, let's just face it, we don't like to submit to people. That's not in vogue in our culture, is it? We as Americans are probably the now, don't get me wrong. I'm as patriotic as anybody in here, I'm pretty sure. I love our country. This is a great country. I believe God has raised it up and has used us as his tool many, many times to beat bullies up. Uh, I think that's pretty plain if you know history. Um, but the, one of the things that we have going against us, we have all these freedoms and we're all about independence, and I'm in agreement with all that. However... Sometimes what that leads us to is the opposite extreme to where we don't think we ought to submit to anything. If this doesn't mean this, I don't know how to interpret the Bible. This is what he's saying. He's not saying you have to agree with everything. This goes at a national level. This also goes at a local level. You may not agree with, you know, whether you live in Scurry with your local leaders there or you live in Crandall or you live here. You may not agree with everything they do, but it's still the law. You know, just to use a crazy illustration, you might not agree that we should drive on the right side of the road. You might like the way they do it in England better. We'll drive on the left side of the road. Well, you have a right to your opinion, but to just do whatever you want to would cause chaos, wouldn't it? And would more than likely get you a ticket. Um, think about a couple of illustrations for a second. Do you remember the night Jesus was betrayed? They're in the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember Jesus is praying for this cup of a crucifixion that he's going to have to go to through to be, please remove this cup from me, but if there's no other way, you know, let your will be done. You remember that. And you remember then when Judas had brought a whole mob of people to come and betray Jesus, and he gave the sign that he was going to kiss Jesus and all that. And it was obvious that Jesus, their leader of the apostles, was going to be taken and put through some mock trials and probably killed, which he was. Do you remember what Peter did when the mob came? pulls out his sword and he cuts off this man's near his this man's ear. I think I said this near's man whatever. This man's ear and his, even tells us his name his name was Malchus. 
cuts off his right ear. He's probably trying, he probably missed. He's probably trying to hit him, you know, in the forehead. And what did Jesus say? Yeah, all the rest of you apostles, get your swords out. Yeah, let's have an uprising. Let's have a revolt. Is that what your Bible says? Jesus said, Peter, put your sword away. That's not how things work in my kingdom. Now, I want to give another example that's real fresh. January the 7th and 8th in Washington, D.C. of this year. Anybody have any idea what happened then? There was an election, as you know. What really happened in that election? I don't know. I don't have any more knowledge of this. You know, I probably have less than you do. Some say, well, you know, they were uh, causing this uprising and storming the Capitol because the election was stolen. Did that happen? I have no idea. I don't know. Maybe it was. Maybe it was. I have no idea. But I'll tell you something. I was ashamed of our country when these people were storming our capital. Brothers and sisters, Christians don't have a right to do that. If, that is, if that's how you think, I would encourage you to go read these words again and go read Romans 13. We are to submit, not because we agree with everything that's happening, but for the Lord's sake, as he says right here. I don't know who all the people were who stormed the Capitol and made a mockery of our system and caused the people around the world to laugh at us, but that's not how you do things. Okay, so let's just say that you're like, well, we, you know, they had to have some way to protest. There are peaceful ways to protest, but Christians don't do that. That causes us, our, our message to be undermined. And once again, I want to put this in context. Keep in mind who Peter is saying this to. He's saying this to Christians who are being oppressed by a brutal dictator that was way worse than Joe Biden. However bad you think Joe Biden is, or Hillary Clinton, or any other Democrats that you think are evil, or Republicans that you think are evil, whichever way, they can't hold a candle to Nero. Nero's a brutal tyrant who takes Christians literally and impales them on poles and covers them with pitch and uses them as torches in his courtyard. We have historical documented records. I don't think Joe Biden's doing that. And knowing that, God inspired Peter to say, we need to submit to them, to every human authority for the Lord's sake. Because it's God's will that by doing good will silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. So, I've done a lot of talking here. I'm going to let anybody make some comments. No comments? I thought surely that would stir some comments up. Okay. Um, look in verse 17. Verse 17, I love this. Well, let me say this one statement before. We don't submit because we're pleased with policies. That's not why we submit. We, we're submitting to please God. That's why we submit. It's not because we agree with policies. There are a lot of policies I don't agree with. But we submit to please God. That's the will of God. Peaceful protesting is the way, I think, in the long run, things are accomplished. I love verse 17 of 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, he gives these little short statements. Show proper respect to everyone, he says. Love the family of believers. Fear God and honor the emperor. Show proper respect to everyone. Don't we all have a problem with that? There are some people that it's easy for all of us to respect because they're respectable people. But he says show respect to everyone. Everybody's made in the image of God. And we forget that when we don't show respect to other people. And usually the people we don't show respect to are people who are doing something to us that we perceive as threatening or harmful or something we don't like. He still says, even in that occasion, show respect to to all people. I'm not saying this is easy and I'm not even saying I'm great at it. I'm saying this is what the word says and it's true. This is how God desires us to live. If we want to have an effect on the ungodly culture around us, when they see this, 
when they see that we honor everyone no matter what they do to us, that will stand out because our culture doesn't do that. Then he says, love the family of believers. Love the, your church family, your family of believers. Not only here locally especially means, but worldwide, which means to act in their best interest. You may not like me, but I'm part of your family. And God is calling you to act in my best interest. And I may not like you, but you're part of my church family. And God is calling me to act in your best interest, whether I feel like it or not. Because love, as we all know, is not about how you feel. Love is an act of the will, not about the feel, to make it rhyme. It's about how we will ourselves to act in loving ways towards other people. Fear God, which means to have God before us all the time and to respect him and everything that we do and honor the emperor. He says it again. Or in our culture, this would be honor the president. Now think about what all the implications of that are. We need to watch what we say, how we say it. We need to watch our posts on Facebook, which I hardly ever get on Facebook anymore. I find it to be a cesspool. I'm still a, a Facebook member, but it's mostly a bunch of mud slinging and this and that, and somebody says something to other people, you know, it's just, it's just a mess. That's my opinion. You might disagree. And I haven't ever figured out the Twitter or Instagram and all that. I've never gotten on that. I'd rather talk to a person, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, but I'm kind of old-fashioned. But the main thing is if we just show respect to people, to all people, regardless of what their mindset is or their attitude is, that's going to stand out in this ungodly world. Uh, look what he says in verse 18. Slaves, in reverent fear, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but to those who are harsh. For it's commendable if someone bears up under pain of unjust suffering because they're conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and you endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. The term slaves, the word slaves right here is an unfortunate translation. A better translation is servants. He's not talking about slaves the way that we think of slavery, that horrible institution that was practiced in this country. By the way, this is kind of an aside, but I want you to think about it for a second. A lot of people have asked this question. You know, one reason I can't follow God, I don't believe the Bible's true, and, I, you know, I don't think it's authoritative and all that, is because the Bible nowhere condemns slavery. Actually, it does. Let me show you where. Well, this is not talking about slavery. This is talking about servants, a household servant. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Simply because the Bible records things doesn't mean it's in agreement with them. It's simply recording what happened. There were slaves in the first century. It doesn't mean he's agreeing with it. But look in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. He says, we know the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly, the sinful, the unholy, and the irreligious, He's talking about people who are unholy, ungodly, so on and so forth, uh, who are lawbreakers and rebels. And then he gives a list of those, those who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders. Did you see that in the middle of that list? The Bible does condemn slavery, the institution of slavery as was practiced in this country the Bible does condemn it, but that's not what this passage is talking about. This passage is talking about something that we can all identify with. He says, he's talking about servants. He says, in reverent freer, you servants, you need to submit to God. There's that word, submit again. Christians are to live a life of submission. The servant class that he's talking about, uh, this obviously is very, very different from a slave. It's not slavery at all. Kind of Kind of to use an illustration, it's kind of like a, uh, to use an analogy, it's like a person who receives a free college education in exchange for doing five years of military service. 
They're obligated to the military. They're enslaved to them, you might say, but they also got a lot of benefit out of it. Or it's kind of like a medical student. Receives a wage. The company is paying them while they're going through school, but they're obligated to that institution who agreed to pay their training. They're obligated to them for a certain period of time to work for them. It's more in that kind of a sense that he's talking about servants here in this passage. Can you think of anyone in the Bible who's a good example of serving and being submissive to an ungodly master? Joseph. That's who I think of also. Remember, he was, uh, he was enslaved, literally enslaved, to Potiphar, Pharaoh's right-hand man. And what was his attitude? If you were going to sum up Joseph's attitude, what was it? Yeah, he was loyal. He did whatever he was supposed to do. He did it to the best of his ability. You couldn't say anything bad about him. He had the utmost of integrity, even though this was an evil pagan ruler. Ken? And Daniel falls in that category as well. Yeah, just great, great attitudes. Uh, I think what he's trying to get across to us is that the, the, the grace of God, the true grace of God is going to be revealed to this world when you and I, uh, even though we're, we're treated unjustly, we act in a way that's pleasing to God in an honorable and a good way. And when we do that, it, it alerts people that this person is different. They're not acting the way everybody else acts. They're not responding with revenge and hatefulness that comes out of their mouth the way everyone else does. And then in verse 21 to 25, he gives us the basis. Here's the reason why we're to be like this. You might have all been wondering, why should we do that? Well, he's going to tell us. Verse 21. To this you were called. If you're a Christian, here's what you have been called to. Here's the reason. Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he didn't retaliate. And when he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, listen to what it says he did. He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. And by his wounds you've been healed. You were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. The reason we are to live lives of submission is because we are Christians. We follow Christ, and that's what he did. You remember when Jesus was being put through those mock trials. What was his attitude? He had done nothing wrong. Being put through mock trials, false accusations made against him, and what was his response? Yeah, the gospel say he just he didn't say anything. He was being quiet. He was being very, very submissive. And as it says right here, and I love this phrase, it says he was entrusting himself to him who judges justly. What does that mean? What does that mean when you entrust yourself to him who judges justly? Yeah. Steve said we may not always get justice here, and that's right. God's never promised that all justice is going to be done here. He did promise there'll be justice one day. Nobody gets away with anything. Now, I don't know how many of you think O.J. was innocent or not. I have no idea. Okay, if you, if you do, okay, we would disagree on that. <laughs> but nobody gets away with anything. Nobody. It might appear that way here and now, but God sees everything. He sees everything that's going on, and there is justice coming one day. Nobody gets away with anything. It says he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And I think that's really important for us because that takes a lot of faith. See, when we try to get revenge and when we try to, uh, uh, when we try to take things into our own control and get back at other people 
and, uh, you know, respond in hateful ways. Like he's been saying throughout here, submit. When we don't want to submit, we say, well, I'll take care of this because that's wrong and I don't agree with that. You know what that really is? It's a lack of faith and trust in God. Jesus had such faith and trust in the Heavenly Father. He says, you know what? I'm entrusting myself to him who judges justly. I'm being done wrong here. And he was. I've done nothing wrong. All kinds of false accusations were made against him. He's done this. He did that. They misinterpreted him. Quoted him out of context. All kinds of things. But he trusted God so much. He said, you know, I trust God's going to take care of it. In his time and in his way, he's going to take care of it. And what you and I do, when we, li when we are living a life of submission, we're trusting God. I know God's going to take care of it. You know, uh, there have been lots of politicians who have been involved in lots of scandals. You know, emails just getting erased and evaporating. You know, that's happened. A um, bunch of people running around in a big uh, hotel one night right before a convention of another another group back in 1970s you might remember what all really happened there I have no idea John F. Kennedy was shot not too far from here in Daly Plaza what really happened there I have no idea but it looks to me like something was afoot at the Circle K that day something not normal was going on that day and there's lots of things like that that happen all throughout history, not only in America, but all over the world. All kinds of, there's corruption everywhere. The way to deal with it, the way Christians deal with it is we say, you know, I trust God's going to take care of it. I'm going to let him deal with it in his way and in his time, and I'm not going to take matters into my own hands. Because can, can you imagine, think about this for, for, uh, for example, those capital riots I mentioned that took place earlier this year in January. Just to use a crazy illustration. Okay, uh, let me use Alan and Ashley for example. Let's just say that it was on the news that me and Alan and Ashley were there leading the charge into the Capitol building. With swords drawn, you know, and, all, and doing all that stuff. That wouldn't be good for our church. That wouldn't be good for churches of Christ in general, would it? Now, we might have felt like doing that, but we entrust ourselves to him who judges justly. We trust that God, he sees everything that's going on. If the election was stolen, whether it was or not, I have no idea. If it was, God will take care of it. Nobody got away with it. Things that are still going to happen in our future that we know nothing about, it's not up to me to fix everything. I can't fix everything. To be like Jesus, I need to learn to entrust myself to him who judges justly. God's going to judge justly. And when you think about that, that gives me a lot of confidence to live without me thinking I have to take care of everything. God watches. He sees everything that's going on. He is going to right every wrong. Every injustice is going to be made right one of these days. And he's a lot more capable of dealing with it than I am. And so because those things are true, Peter says, live a life of submission. Because when we do that, it shows the world around us, hey, they, they're living for someone other than this world. And it points them to him and gets their attention. Like I started off this lesson with tonight, and I kind of conclude with this. Those Indians, when they heard that missionary speak, the chief said, well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to watch these white men. And we're going to see if your preaching has any effect on them, if they're any different than other ones that we've dealt with. And if it is different, then we'll follow up with you on what we've heard. If not, then you're just wasting our time. Anybody have any closing comments? Yeah, one of the fruits of the Spirit is 
self-control. And that definitely fits in here with what we've been talking about. Okay, let's close with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that you've left to us tonight. I pray that you will give all of us a spirit of submission. Help us to be in submission to the governing authorities. Help us to be in submission to one another. Help us to live lives of love and honor and respect. Help us to love all people. Help us to do good to all people. And help us always to entrust ourselves to you. Forgive us of times uh, when we don't have the self-control that we should have. Forgive us of taking matters into our own hands. God, I just pray that you'll help us to live the kind of life that Jesus lived. That even though he was done wrong, he was mocked, made fun of, false accusations done against him, and ultimately killed, the whole time he entrusted himself to you. And that made a huge impact on those who were watching him be crucified. Even on a hardened Roman soldier who said, truly, this was the Son of God. And I pray that it will have that same kind of effect on our culture around us when they See us, that we are uh, living lives in submission to you. Help us to do that as we leave this building. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.